Centered. So just be still, be aware, be balanced. And that might include having support. That's okay. Weight evenly distributed so you can relax. Connect with your core. That's to say, basically feel your belly and let it relax. And check again, being aware, just aware. So simple. Just being here now. Okay, thanks. So now that's a little thing you can just do any time through the day. You can do it in five seconds, just aware. That's it, you know, and it's a very, it can be a useful little thing to realize how simple that can be. So um, anytime you're not sure that it occurs to you, like, hey, am I sort of aware right now? Just check, do the little, do the little mini thing, awareness, balance, core, ABC, and you'll, you'll, you probably will be by the end of it, if you're not already. Okay, so uh, let's see, you know, basically, um, tonight, I want to carry on with what I was doing last week, which was answering some questions left over from the last retreat. By the way, this upcoming retreat, actually, Johanna, thanks very much for your very nice announcements and about that, including about that. But actually, Valerie and I have been in dialogue about this retreat, and we're going to actually do do it like this. We thought it was probably just going to be me leading it, but actually, I'm going to give a talk, Valerie's going to give a talk, and then I'm going to give two talks. So it's going to be kind of mostly me, but very kindly, Valerie's offered to to step in and offer one. I mean, you know, she's been doing so much these recent months, just basically six retreats i think in two months so um i don't want her to burn out she doesn't want to burn out and um so i'm taking on a little bit more you know um but it'll all it all we want it to just be evening out in the long run by the way just so you know that thank you valerie um okay so before I answer the questions from, or do my best to address the questions from the retreat, a handful of them, I thought actually first, kind of like last week also, I'm just gonna read you a bit. I hope you don't mind. It's, it's essentially like last week, actually, it's a passage from um, a new book that I've been working on. And um, this book is a kind of statement of, what I've been really working on in a sense or developing, I feel over the last two, three years, there was a point about, I'm guessing uh, two to three years ago, at some point I gave a talk that was a kind of revision of an early Zen teaching called the five kinds of Zen. Actually in its earliest iteration from Wei Nung, it was four kinds of Zen outlining four kind of styles of practice, aspirations for practice, uh, ranging from wanting to basically be calmer and uh, less reactive and better able to focus and work better in our worldly lives and have more effective and helpful and positive relationships and generally be more wholesome in fairly pragmatic kind of ways all the way up to, you know, full on awakening and um, infinite numbers of lifetimes of serving other beings and trying to help them awaken too. You know, so what I what I've done was uh, back then I gave a talk where I did a sort of uh, more contemporary reiteration of those and slightly sort of changed and tweaked and adapted them. Actually, you know, what, one thing that happened then after that talk was sort of un, un, unbeknownst to me, actually, Johanna had very kindly taken notes and she actually typed up a couple of pages that summarized the talk. And 
I took those and I thought, wow, that is, that is very helpful. And I looked at them, I thought, yeah, I sort, of, I, I sort of agree with what I said for once, you know, because usually I change my mind six months later, but they sort of held up. And now, and now last year, you know, many, many of you, I think, probably attended at least one or two of these retreats that I'd called Original Love, that were working through essentially the same four zones or areas that I think are very pertinent to meditation practice. And, it, it, and we're wise if we address all four of them in some way, or at least can cognize, are cognizant of them. And um, I see them as um, really bridging the gap if I'm right in believing that there is a gap, because I do believe there is a bit of a gap between modern contemporary mindfulness practice and practices that are aware of and engaged in and work toward and work beyond awakening. It seems there's quite a big gap that there are practices, Zen is one of them, there are others that are aware of this human possibility of awakening. And there's a risk actually associated with those practices, ours, of putting emphasis on that in ways that aren't helpful, number one, but also in neglecting more ordinary human issues that probably the sort of more grounded, basic, simple practice of mindfulness is more likely to address. And on the other hand, there is that mindfulness practice that, you know, hundred million, I mean, literally, there was a survey a year ago by Civic Science, which I think is reliable, that came up with some staggering figures like then, it's probably grown since then, then already something like over 40% of adult Americans had meditated or did regularly meditate. And another 15% were planning to and very much wanted to soon. So that's over 55% of adult Americans either doing it or have done it or will do it, probably by now have. I mean, that's more than half the adult population. It's probably getting to saturation point, you'd think. <laughs> and um, anyway, but all of those many millions, how many are actually even aware of mindfulness as a foundation that can take you to extraordinary discoveries about our human nature that are profound and profoundly helpful. So this little thing, you know, with those re retreats called Original Love um, is, I wouldn't call it step by step, but it's addressing these different four different zones that we humans can grow in and to which meditation practice is pertinent. And actually I've written a, well, I am working on a book that's sort of about this and I'm going to just read you a bit. This is like early on in the bit that finally addresses the matter of awakening. And I'm trying to be, um, what's the word? Is it, it's not really ecumenical. I'm just trying to, yeah, kind of ecumenical. I'm trying to, you know, recognize that this is not, uh, many, many traditions have an angle on this. So here's a little bit um, early in the section on awakening. Long ago, I was fortunate to visit Mount Athos, a peninsula, in, a peninsula in northern Greece dedicated to the monastic life of the Orthodox Church, a place where only men are allowed. Athos is a sanctuary of deep practice. There actually is a comparable equivalent peninsula for women as well, uh, for nuns, essentially. Our little party was led by a devout icon pa painter, a monastic hermit at the time called Brother Aidan, who later followed God's calling to marry and raise a family while continuing his life as an icon maker. He was a beautiful man to be around, deeply trained in his spiritual path. For years, his practice had been the continuous recitation of the Jesus prayer, beloved of Russian orthodoxy, with guidance from his elders. And it had made him a radiant person, as if he brought with him a clear, plain 
refreshing kind of daylight into any room he was in. His primary guide was in fact an abbot in one of the monasteries on Mount Athos, whom he revered to the extent of being exultant when it turned out that we all would be granted an audience with him. The old abbot had a long silver beard, as did many of the monks, and there was a stillness about him, a deep quiet that he felt, apart from the long hair and beard and the golden ornaments that adorned his dusty black robes. He reminded me of some Zen masters I had met, a shining clarity in his eyes, a calm and capacious presence. We met with him in a large room overlooking the Aegean Sea far below. The monastery was built into a cliff some 1400 years ago in its oldest parts. This ancient beamed room had been resting here, filled with holy practice that long. It was a beautiful place to be, not austere, because although plain and simple, it shone with the gold frames of icons on the walls, and the air was rich with candle wax and incense. He spoke to us in French, which I could understand. At one point, our leader invited me to share something about Zen, hoping to get a conversation going about parallel paths of spiritual cultivation, which seemed pertinent to me too. After all, here were two traditions, Orthodox monasticism, which was very much a kind of training, and Zen, that both believed in training the human spirit in order that it might be brought closer to the loving reality at its core. I was tongue-tied and shy and offered a garbled, meager sentence or two about Zen. The abbot listened and paused. All he said in response was that Zen was too foreign. It was like a long, narrow bridge. When a shock came, the bridge would fall. I was still quite young in practice then and felt both shy and offended. I kept quiet after that and didn't tell him what I thought, which was that far from being any kind of bridge, Zen seemed to be the shortest... Mm. Sorry, how's this going? The, 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 the most direct shortcut possible to my own human heart and human nature. It brought me home to who I was, as I was, again and again, warts and all, in a way that I couldn't imagine could be bettered. Also, I disliked the abbot's implicit assumption, which I assumed was there, that Christianity would be some kind of home for me. What did he know? I had been brought up an atheist and I was half Jewish. The old gray beard rattled me. He stung me in a way only an elder can sting a young distrustful man. His words echoed long after. Un pont très long et étroit. A bridge long and narrow. But paradoxically, perhaps in the way of Zen, over the next year or two, it was he who determined me to rededicate myself more assiduously to my then flagging Zen practice. He drove me, in fact, to finding my first true Zen teacher. But the main point that I want to make here is not exactly that. It's that this very man of God described a time when he had discovered that God was all things. He had been coming home one evening on the same ferry that had brought us to Athos. It was late afternoon and the deep rich light before sunset had turned the mountain the mountain of Athos itself, which dominates the peninsula, into a glorious eminence, glowing in the late light. 
He gazed at it from the boat, fascinated by it. He told us this story, you know. And before his eyes, the mountain dissolved into golden light. At the same time, everything else crumbled and became the same glowing light, including himself. It was then, he said, that he saw the true face of God. This wasn't the only way God showed himself, but from then on, he'd had no doubt that God was in all things and that God was all things. And all things were God. And it was only our fallen nature, our sin, our misguidedness that prevented our seeing this. Therefore, we must train in order to recognize what we are and in what ways we truly belong here on earth. I was astounded to hear all this. It paralleled Zen awakening rather closely. So closely, in fact, that his disapprobation of Zen stung all the more fiercely. Yet it greatly encouraged me too. If these Orthodox monks could discover something so similar, who cared what we called it? God, emptiness, original nature, Buddha nature, it really didn't matter. In all cases, it allowed us to see what it allowed us to see what we and this world really were, and through that to find our part in life. We were part of an original love. And against the reality of that fact, what did a name matter? Any name was just as good as any other. Any name, in fact, was chaff in the wind. Okay, so forgive me. I mean, I hope that's, you know, whatever. It's, the, it's a little part coming towards this rather long section on different kinds of awakening. Trying to sort of, I want the book to be non-exclusive, if possible. I'm, I'm rather hard on Christianity, actually, in other parts of the book which I think is a lot to answer for personally. But I think it's also I'm trying to acknowledge the fact that God can mean different things. Doesn't have to mean the stern judge in the sky, you know, uh, who's done an awful lot of damage to human, pe human beings over two to 3,000 years and has a lot of millions of deaths to answer for, as far as I'm concerned. Well, maybe not him, but the church that has claim to represent him but there's another meaning of god obviously which is much more like mystery much more like what we don't know much more like what we're doing here i hope i hope um yeah <laughs> okay so, um, questions. Um, I'm just going to carry on where we got to. Here's a question. This has been an amazingly deep retreat and I found so much peace. Great, thank you. Well, I mean, I'm not saying, sorry. Congratulations to your own practice for, for that. How do we go back to the world slash reality tomorrow and keep that peace without taking the bait and going back to the reactions slash muscular contractions that come when dealing with others. Can you please comment on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's our sort of, it seems it's a recurring question. I mean, it happens on all levels. You know, the, the principle of this style of Zen training perhaps is um, gradual cultivation, gradual cultivation. Maybe sometimes if we're lucky, sudden awakening, and then back to gradual cultivation, gradual cultivation, gradual cultivation. Maybe then again, if we're lucky, another flash of awakening and back to gradual cultivation, gradual 
cultivation. It's what we do. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, incredible revelatory moments can happen. They do happen. They happen through practice and they happen occasionally without practice. But they're not much use unless they kind of get dug into a life, if you know what I mean. The way you dug, you dig a, a manure into soil. They have to be folded into life. They have to change how we live. And um, so it doesn't really matter if you have them or not, because the, the gradual cultivation is going to be what counts. Either way. I know people who have been gradually cultivating for many years who are deep, wise, kind human beings, the kind of human beings we want around even though they may not have had a flash of sudden awakening. So now, I know this is a slightly different question, but it's kind of parallel in a little way because we come on a, on a retreat and yeah, we may have a sort of a deeper, clearer time. We may touch great peace. We may, we may find um, this, the, the, the beauty of being, that shows itself through stillness. That through being still, especially in a group of other people who are being still, uh, we can find um, astonishingly beautiful qualities in our very being that need nothing. They only need to be given a chance to show themselves. They're always here. And we can find this and it's marvelous. And, and, you know, we, 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 I'm not even talking about real awakening. I'm talking about deep states of stillness and quiet and peace and bliss and joy and delight and ease and healing, healing balm of practice that can come just through being still. It's a fantastic thing that we can, find so much happiness with so much less. You know, it's like, it's almost the opposite of what we do. We, we're, we're trying to get happy much of the time with, with, with things, with stuff, with activities, with, well, you know, whatever, interactions, activities, and things, and all the commotion, you know. And wow, we can get entirely different orders of happiness with much less and a retreat can show us that and what a wonderful thing that is so now what happens after that and i've sort of you know got to go back to whatever it is you know screaming young family or you know or whatever you know or, or um just work and work a day things and there's bills and there's the car needs servicing and the this and the that, hassles, problems. How do I um, how do I navigate all that after this blessed peace? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I can only tell you what I've heard from my teachers and what I sort of have picked up a little bit along the way from many different sources, I guess. I mean, the first thing is, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, things take their course. And one of the great teachings of Zen seems to be sort of don't interfere too much. And that would include even with practice and how things go in practice. And if practice means the sitting side and the daily life side, which in Sambo Zen we think it does, the same would apply there. Like, be patient. Don't be too demanding on, on yourself. Of You should rest in some glorious state of samadhi even while you're being overcharged for a new set of tires <laughs> or something like that. Or even while, you know, you, you um, I don't know, you know, typical hassles that come up. The, the, well, I mean, just before this sit, I, I wasn't particularly happy. The internet stopped working. You know, we, Mountain Cloud is very kindly paying for expensive internet at our house. And it's right now, it's doing this infuriating thing that it works in most parts of the house, 
but it does not work in my room where I want to do all my Zen stuff and I want to do retreats and sits like this. So I'm in the kitchen. So I've got, you've probably noticed this odd, well, this very beautiful picture behind me. You can't see all of it. Let me show you actually. It's a remarkable picture by a Mexican artist friend of mine, Ricardo Mazal. Uh, he did a whole series of paintings on Mount Kailash. I'm going to just get my head out of the way. I don't know if you can just kind of get a sense of how that might be inspired by Mount Kailash. If any of you have seen, Mount Kailash is this extraordinary pyramidal mountain in the middle of the Him Himalayas that's kind of black rock with streaks of ice, white ice. There's a study, you Google it, it's a stunning, it's a very, the holiest mountain on earth. And this, this painting was inspired by that. Anyway, I'm in the kitchen. He gave it to me actually, because I, I wrote something about his work once. And, um, and so I'm in the kitchen. Actually, I don't really want to be in the kitchen. I want to be, <laughs> I want to be on my Zafu in my nice little Zen sanctuary, you know. <laughs> I was a bit rattled, you know, well, too bad, you know, so what really? I didn't, I didn't break anything. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do anything outwardly harmful. I didn't shout. I didn't, I was just a bit rattled, you know, and I, I don't care really. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to have, um, you know, okay, here's it. Let me, I don't know whether this is any help to the, the questioner. Actually, I don't even know if the question is here, but I mean, I guess it's a question for all of us, very likely. Um, here's the thing. If we see through clearly enough, meaning really see this thing, shunyata, that is not a thing, that means emptiness, it means that all things are empty. All things are showing up just as they are, and no matter what they are, they are also empty. Like that abbot on Athos seeing, basically, in our terminology, that Mount Athos is actually empty. And through seeing that, seeing that there's a pervasive emptiness, kind of behind everything in everything sort of behind everything and as everything if that gets clearer it can actually loosen our attachment to fine states of mind because they too are empty it doesn't quite mean what some mm, some enlightened masters have taken it to mean which is that anything goes if you see what i mean it can be taken that way very harmfully and that's wrong because there's something missing in that View. Do you get what I'm saying? That if you, if you accept and if you've seen that everything is empty, you could say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm totally free. It doesn't matter what I do. It's all empty. That's a very dangerous doctrine, actually, if it can be called a doctrine, for obvious reasons, because it, would, it, would, it, would, it could theoretically strip away all ethical concerns or moral concerns in a very dangerous way. It's actually called the pit of emptiness to think like that. That's, that's one of the dimensions of the so-called pit of emptiness, Zen zone terminology. The danger of thinking that because all things are empty, nothing sort of matters. Because the other side of this emptiness is actually that it brings us into I mean, astonishingly, really, into an immediate intimacy with all things. So we are one with all. And what that very commonly brings up is a strong, strong sense of love, of compassion, 
of caring, a tenderness that's fierce that um, we may not have known before, or we may have we may have known similar things before, but it's probably going to be stronger if we ex encounter emptiness. Now, but on the same time, there's a positive side to this as well, which is a you know, it doesn't matter so much if you have some reactions and you get some muscular contractions. It doesn't matter so much if your mood isn't perfectly blessed, gloriously beneficent, beatific. <laughs> it doesn't matter quite so much. And actually, we don't really want nauseatingly beatific humans, really. Do we want... We <laughs> Do we? I don't know. Hold on a sec. I've got to put my screen cover on. I think we, we just want ever deeper kindness. And, you know, that's, that includes being kind to ourselves and accepting kindly that we're not perfect. We will take the bait. We will go back to reactions now and then. If you, but I mean, the comment I suppose I would also say is that, um, you know, that little ABC trick that I introduced at the beginning of the talk, you can do it kind of any time and get, get a little more disciplined about doing it once you get the hang of it. And of course, there's many other little tricks. And the, other, the one when I, I was taught as a kid, I never used to do it, was count to 10. <laughs> Just count to 10. I never really wanted to, but I think it probably works. Just put that little gap between you and your, you know, the, something happens, the reaction comes up. Before you act or speak, just put a little gap in there. You know, and maybe counting to 10 very fast might even be enough to just make that gap. Okay, next question. For someone in the first few years of practice, how should one divide their time between reading and listening about the Dharma compared to solitary practice on the cushion. Yeah, it's, it's not a very easy question to answer decisively. I mean, there's a place for reading and listening to talks and because it can be inspiring and encouraging. Um, And I mean, obviously, but obviously that doesn't actually compare with sitting. As the sitting on the cushion is the thing. But if you're doing it without any um, encouragement or guidance or inspiration, it might be very arid and bleak. So we want to fertilize it. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, actually if you read... Um, Zen the Authentic Gate, there's a nice story about, about this question in there, which is a kind of a, perhaps a bit of a cautionary tale about a couple. I, I think you'll find it in the book if you read it, so I won't, I won't tell you now. But I, I'd say the sitting is paramount, but it's good to, to fertilize it. Something like that. Is this question of the solitary practice on the cushion? I mean, it's true that we we do we do you know commonly sit alone unless we're probably in some kind of monastic context. Um, in a lay context, you know, our daily sits often would be alone. Uh, during Zoom and COVID, we've had a whole lot more communal sitting actually on a daily, weekly basis. Um, it's because you don't have to, you know, it's easy. You just you can do it from home. You don't have to travel for it. Um, but I mean, the practice shouldn't only be alone. It's really good and valuable, rather in the same kind of way of getting the encouragement of uh, things that are spoken and, and written about practice to also just have some sort of gathering of fellow practitioners that you can sit with now and then. Okay, next question. Just what's that podcast with Alan Watts pasted in? Where can I find that? Okay, I'm just going to say right now, that was a podcast called Below the Line by James Bashara. That's B-E-S-H-A-R-A. -A. Uh, it's in there somewhere. Um, 
Okay. Henry, can you give us a brief explanation of the Tao as mentioned in yesterday's Q and A? Um, let me just say that, um, you know, I'm not a scholar and I'm not an expert on Taoism at all, at all. I only really know a little of how it touches Zen and how it shows up in Zen. But one of the best um, accounts of it that I've read, and at least an account that I found inspiring, is David Hinton's. He's got a book called Existence, and he's got another book called China Root, which both look at the Tao um, <clears throat> in a way that would speak to us as Zen practitioners. I mean, I, I can summarize one little thing about it. He, he says that what the Tao is essentially is it has two faces. One face he translates as absence, absence. And the other face he translates as existence tissue existence hyphen tissue like the tissue of all existence the fabric of all things that arise and that means not only all external things you know the things of the world but as part of that also our conceptual cognitive internal mental lives so all of that is one tissue or fabric. Now, I think, you know, assuming he's somewhat reliable on this as a scholar and translator and practitioner, um, it, it, it seems to me quite easy to see how, how and why, you know, Chinese practitioners were interested when Buddhism came in because it, Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism, you know, talks about shunyata, um, emptiness, and tathagata, or the tathagata garba, which means uh, complex, complicated terms, but they essentially mean all things that are arising, or things as they're arising. It's sometimes translated suchness, but it's something rather like that existence tissue it's the it's the all all phenomena appearing so that you know in buddhism at least in mahayana buddhism there's some kind of theoretical notion of you know comparable you know absence or emptiness and sort of the flip side being all this world of appearances so they i think they they um what sort of connected well they were ready to be kind of hybridized in Zen, syncretized into Zen. Um, okay, the next question is, what is the experience of non-dual awareness and how is it related to awakening? Okay, well, I can tell you what I understand from some non-dual teachers that um, I've met and listened to and and so on, and, and being guided by somewhat in, in different times in my life. By the way, these non-dual teachings today, which are very popular, you, know, um, you can find a lot of it on the web, um, they are usually like a sort of contemporary take on Advaita, Hindu Advaita teachings. Uh, Advaita means non-dual, adva, uh, not two, in Sanskrit. Um, and um, what they what they usually draw from um, is um, something called the Turiya, which literally means the fourth, and it's the fourth of four kinds of consciousness that um, some of the Upanishads say exist and the four kinds are waking 
normal wake waking consciousness, dreaming consciousness, deep sleep consciousness, which is sort of unconscious. And the Turiya is actually what underlies all three of those. The fourth, Turiya literally means fourth, is what underlies all three of them. And it's, it is described as boundless, infinite, empty of content, without characteristics. So non-dual practice usually today, these days, is to one way or another, usually not exactly through meditation, but more through kind of, sometimes they call it pointing practice, or sort of little guidance and little hints and different ways of doing it. But, you know, to start to realize that, okay, we're aware. I mean, close your eyes right now. You know, we're aware. We have a sense of awareness of body. We have a sense of awareness of the room we're in. You know, you can sit here and kind of feel awareness actually sort of spreading out into the room and including the room. And it can go beyond the walls of the room. It can go outside. It can include everything from the body to the room, to the house, to beyond the house. And actually, this ordinary awareness that we ordinarily live with is simply like a little imaginary tank that we create the walls of somehow in our minds that are completely illusory. And actually, this little piece of awareness that we normally have, it is none other than a boundless awareness. And if you just sort of let, let yourself sort of soften into awareness spreading, 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 it goes on and on and on, beyond the house, beyond the yard, beyond the local streets, beyond the city, into the mountains, across the plain, beyond the state lines in all directions, and on to the next states, onto the coasts, and beyond the coasts, around the world and beyond the world, out through the atmosphere, into the solar system, and then beyond the solar system, into the galaxy and beyond the galaxy. It just goes on and on and on. There's simply no boundary to it. And when we are doing that kind of practice, we can sometimes get a real hit of, <gasps> it may be a momentary thing, just a little hint. Really feeling this boundless awareness and being just a hint that that's what I am. So that's what, non-dual awareness commonly is i mean I, I you know there's there's other ways people might describe it and that's that's rather crude what i was just suggesting but how's it related to awakening well in some traditions it is awakening to awaken is to have the contraction into the a sense of awareness being only i only this little me, to have that contraction dissolve, cease, release. And suddenly, what I really am, the real I am, is a boundless awareness. And the ordinary I is just a little, is a contraction that fools us into thinking it, uh, that's what we are. An awakening is to release that and find that we are, in fact, boundless awareness, boundless consciousness. Now, the, the, so that's how some traditions define awakening. What, um, what we would say in Zen is that that's one face of awakening. If it's, if it's got to be a pretty strong experience of that, really. 
for for us to consider it awakening because you can have little hits of it relatively easily actually and um that's fine and nice but it's not very strong and it's not very convincing and it doesn't really usually you know create much of an upheaval in a life usually but there are other faces of awakening quite different quite different you know it's quite a different thing for example to see solidly i am all things i am inseparable solidly from all things not that there's a kind of vast container that's empty and clear and aware and all things are in it different to see solidly i'm part of a solidity of all things of course also different to see that that just isn't quite anything you know and to actually discover that even awareness even consciousness is a phenomenon as the heart sutra says no mind no consciousness anyway i don't want to get too technical but um i hope that's answered that question enough and just the last one that i'm going to address is it seems that in this last retreat uh, some of you i think probably i can't really tell but a good number of you probably were on it we were looking at this koan of rosso this old master facing the wall and somebody's asked it seems as if rosso would appeal to anti-authoritarian types did he have that sort of air <laughs> interesting um i mean i think zen doesn't it have quite a tradition of being um well i was going to say sort of anti-authoritarian but I, i don't know it's a little complicated because it is in some regards because it's so um wild and un unruly and these masters can't they're just like they're just you can't pin them down you can't you can't um i mean the stories of the wild ways they taught are just crazy they're not they're not um you know regular doctrinal anything at all they're just because they're, they're so awakened they're so free and so clear that well, kind of you can't fall out of the you can't fall out of reality the deep deep deepest reality of who you are you, you can't lose it you can't fall out of it you, they're just trying to shock people off into into realizing what they are who they are you know and this was rosso's way he would just turn and face the wall he wouldn't engage in talking and answering questions and telling people to do this or do that he just faced the wall was that i mean sort of a there it is you know so um but i think that um you can find that kind of thing quite a lot in the zen uh in the zen annals um so i think zen as a whole kind of has an anti-authoritarian thing to it but in all the on the other hand you know you have these you know throughout its history you've had masters sort of ruling kind of over monasteries small or large with with quite a bit of um force so that's a bit authoritarian i mean it's one of the things that turned me off when i was first trying to find um it took me a while to find a zen teacher it was that you know quite a few of the masters you know parading around in fancy robes and you know being incredibly sort of self important i thought and um it seemed totally unnecessary and frankly it still seems totally unnecessary to me even now and um i mean i can i can get that in some kind of spiritual training which i suppose this is you know a, a bit of authority a bit of, uh, yes we need at some point to to trust someone enough to a little bit at least be told what to do and do it you know um so yeah i think there sort of has to be a bit of authority but authoritarian is another thing is is a good question um did he have that sort of air well the truth about rosso or luzu is that um i think the only thing we know about him is this little snippet of a koan as far as i know this literally all that survived 
The only trace of him is this little snippet that whenever someone came, he turned and faced the wall. <laughs> yeah, what a remarkable life. Isn't that a great little biography? I'm just taking off my card here. Okay. His life, Rosa's life is right here. When someone came, whenever someone came, Rosso turned and faced the wall. Actually, do we need to know any more about him? Could we entertain the thought that we might not? Everything he could give us is right there. Everything he could give us to sort of give us our own deep, deeper life, fuller life, richer life, greater life is right there. Oh, what a gift. What a gift. Okay. Um, so we'll stop there. And it's very kind of you all to sit and listen. And um, I hope this has been some, I hope it's been, you know, kind of interesting, basically. I hope it hasn't been too boring, first of all. And I hope it's been some inspiration for your practice. Obviously, that would be a positive. And I hope, um, well, I hope you have a very nice rest of the evening. <laughs> and um, actually, I really hope you come to the retreat next week. I think it's going to be a really nice retreat. And and um, this Moo practice, I've got to tell you, I've been sitting with Moo since deciding to do this retreat. I'm blown away by how marvelous mood practice can be and i really hope that i'll be able to convey something of that through the retreat and valerie too okay okay look it's i've gone on a bit longer than i expected my apologies um have a lovely rest of the evening and uh let's say goodbye thank you thank you so much peg thank you johanna